Oxnard, 1961. Produced and photographed by Dr. Ted Greathouse. Assisted by L.S. Leisure and David Greathouse. Narrator, Dana Marble. Sound engineer, Paul Schneider. Narrative compiled and edited by Dr. Greathouse. The film you're about to see is the story of a grandfather who decided one day that it was time that his five-year-old grandson, David, learned a little more about the town in which he lived. So very early in the year of 1961, Grandfather Lee stopped by the home of his grandson and picked him up to begin one of the most unusual experiences that any little boy could possibly have. As David's father and having an interest in photography, I decided to go along and take pictures of the adventure so that someday when David is a grown man, he will have a pictorial record of the city of Oxnard as it was when he was first beginning to take an interest in the world around him. Grandpa Lee decided that the first thing he and David should do was to take a drive down the main street of town. In Oxnard, this happens to be called A Street. As we drove along, we couldn't help but wonder what spectacular changes would take place in the fast-growing city in the next 10 or 20 years. We knew that in the last 10 years, the population had jumped from 24,000 in 1951 to 46,000 at the end of 1961. The land area had increased from 2,400 to 5,400 acres. Recent studies looking into the future have predicted that by 1980 the population will be over 100,000 and that Oxnard will encompass a vast area bounded by the Santa Clara River to the north, the Pacific Ocean to the west and south, and the middle of the Oxnard Plain to the east. We couldn't help but feel an air of excitement as we contemplated the future greatness of the city of Oxnard. Our first stop was the plaza, one of Oxnard's historical landmarks located in the middle of the downtown district. This refreshing little spot of greenery offers a welcome relief from the hustle and bustle of the busy city life which surrounds it. The pagoda, built in 1910, annually becomes the source of discussion between those who would tear it down in the name of progress and those who treasure its historical memories. The lovely nativity scene was first started by the Chamber of Commerce in 1952 as a Christmas display. Later it was donated to the city, which along with the Ministerial Association now perpetuate the scene which each year draws visitors who come to enjoy its inspirational qualities. With this mellow scene still pictured in our minds, we then paid a visit to the home of our city government. When the city hall was first constructed in 1925, it served as a junior high school. At that time, Oxnard's population was only 5,650. 
By the end of 1961, it had reached a total of 46,000. Because of this rapidly exploding growth, plans are underway to build new city administrative buildings in a modern civic center. Oxnard has a city government composed of five city councilmen elected by the citizens. The council elects one of its own members to serve as mayor of the town. The council also hires a city manager to run the daily business of the city and to help the council plan for an orderly and progressive growth and development. During 1961, the council handled many difficult problems and made many far-reaching decisions which will influence the city's future for generations to come. As we were leaving City Hall, David noticed one of Oxnard's distinguishing landmarks shining brightly in the sunshine and asked what it was. We explained to David that this was the city water storage tank, built in 1950 at a cost of $237,000, and that it had a capacity of one million gallons of water. David said that someday he would like to climb to the top of the tower to see what he could see from up there. So, to satisfy his young curiosity, I decided to make that long hand-over-hand -hand climb up the tube in the center of the 135-foot tower. Being inside the darkened tube with the wind whistling by provides a rather eerie experience, as you can look straight down and straight up to the trap door at the top. From the top, there is a spectacular view of the Oxnard Plain sprawling below in all directions. As we look east, we can see the hills beyond the town of Camarillo, just nine miles away. In this direction, we see the former uh, location of the old sugar beet factory and on beyond the location of the Camarillo State Hospital, which employs a staff of close to 2,000. If we were to travel in a southeasterly direction, we would come to the fabulous Point Magoo Naval Missile Station and on down the Pacific Coast Highway to Santa Monica and San Diego. Looking due south, we observe Oxnard Boulevard reflecting the sunlight while the Pacific Ocean sparkles in the background less than five miles away. Moving in a southwesterly direction, we would go only a short distance to the historic town of Port Wainemi and the home of the U.S. Naval Construction Battalion Center. In the background, sharply outlined against the sky, one can observe the Channel Islands only a few miles offshore. They provide endless opportunities for water sports enthusiasts. If you were to travel in a northwesterly direction for about 40 miles, you would come to the beautiful city of Santa Barbara, or you could continue on to San Francisco by the Golden Gate. Now we begin to see the hills behind the town of Ventura, only 10 miles away, and continue to marvel at the broad expanses of the fertile Oxnard Plain. One becomes a little nostalgic when reading the predictions that by 1980 the city of Oxnard will have pushed itself out to the edge of the Santa Clara River, and in so doing will have consumed this vast area which now boasts some of the most productive farmland anywhere in the world. Traveling in a northerly direction, we would pass through such small towns as El Rio, Satacoy, Santa Paula, and Fillmore. A northeasterly route would take us through some of Ventura County's most beautiful scenery and soon bring us to one of the country's most rapidly developing areas, that of the Sami Valley. Traveling east once more would take us through the fabulous Thousand Oaks development and on by high-speed freeway into the metropolis of Los Angeles. The facts regarding the water tower didn't impress a five-year-old too much, 
but the sight of a fire engine racing to answer a fire alarm really stimulated his interest. It was a real thrill for David as well as us older youngsters to watch the firemen at work displaying their professional know-how and precision teamwork. Oxnard boasts one of the most efficient fire departments in the country. In fact, in 1961, while fire insurance rates were going up in most parts of the country, they were actually reduced in Oxnard. This is quite a tribute to these men who periodically are called upon to risk their lives to protect the property and save the lives of the citizens of our city. Ten years ago, the fire department consisted of only 17 members, while today there are over 40 men in the department, and the beginning firemen draw a starting salary of $432 per month. It was interesting to learn that the fire department actually performs many other functions not generally known by the public, such as registering voters, conducting Boy Scout merit badge tests, giving fire prevention demonstrations, issuing dog licenses, organizing junior fire marshal programs, and many more. David had often expressed a desire to go down to the airport and watch the airplanes land and take off. So Grandpa Lee agreed that our next stop would be the Ventura County Airport, located just west of the city limits of Oxnard. Almost everyone agrees that an up-to-date airport facility is a great asset to the progressive development of a growing city. Some of the land for the airport was first purchased in 1934 as a county venture. And in 1961, it is appraised at $3.3 million. Since its inception, it has gradually grown until now it handles 5,000 passengers yearly on regularly scheduled airliners, which connect with flights to all parts of the world. The airport was a busy place in 1961 and chalked up a record of 78,000 flights by various aircraft, including the more than 130 airplanes based here. Aside from its commercial passenger business, the airport serves as a base for the National Guard aircraft whose staff bring a $100,000 annual payroll into the area. Crop dusting, new aircraft sales, and various other industrial enterprises use the airport as their headquarters. The county is justifiably proud of its new $258,000 control tower, which directs traffic on the aerial highways in and around Ventura County. Because we were already heading in a westerly direction, it seemed only natural to keep on going until we had come to one of the newest and most exciting developments in this area. Since the boundaries of the city limits of Oxnard are only a short distance from the new small boat harbor, it means that when completed, the citizens of Oxnard will have a playground right in their own backyard. Every little boy dreams of someday owning his own boat and sailing the seas. Thanks to the progressive planning of the Ventura County supervisors, this will become a reality in the near future. Dredging of the harbor began in 1961, and when completed, it will house over 1,000 boats and cover a land area of 324 acres. The harbor is being financed in cooperation with federal, state, and county agencies and represents a cost of over $11 million. In order to stop the process of erosion near the government installations in this area, gigantic dredges moved millions of tons of sand almost two miles down coast, which at the same time greatly improved the bathing beaches. By looking north from the small boat harbor, the dominant structure on the horizon is the Edison Company's generating plant. These towering columns of steel and pipe appeal to David's curiosity, and I must confess that his father and grandfather were equally anxious to know more about the workings of this gigantic structure. We received a cordial reception from all hands as we toured the plant. 
We learned that the Mandalay Steam Station was completed in 1959 at a cost of over $52 million and that it has two identical generators, each capable of generating enough power to meet the electrical requirements of a city of 250,000 people. The water for cooling the steam used in the turbines is supplied by means of a canal, which stretches from the small boat harbor to the plant for a distance of four and one-half miles. In order to acquire water free of minerals for their boilers, the Edison Company built an experimental salt water conversion plant without federal assistance, which has attracted worldwide interest. In the master control room, we were surprised to learn that every phase of the operation can be controlled from one point. They even have television cameras located so that it is possible to see if the furnaces are burning properly. Certainly one of the biggest news stories of 1961 was the disclosure of the annexation of the Edison plant to the city of Oxnard. By its very presence in the region, it has had a decidedly encouraging effect upon the attraction of many new industries to the Oxnard area by assuring ample power for their needs. The annexation of the property to the city of Oxnard added approximately one-third to the tax base and will increase revenues for the city by about $250,000 annually. Any area enclosed by a fence and protected by guards creates its own air of mystery and curiosity. By obtaining special permission, we were allowed to pass these barriers and become more familiar with the functions of the U.S. Naval Construction Battalion Center. Although the center is located just outside the city limits of Oxnard, it has played a tremendous part in the growth and prosperity of the city. We were fortunate in having an opportunity to talk to the retiring admiral and to take the last picture of him as he was leaving the base for the final time in his career. Following this meeting, the captain in charge took us on a personal guided tour of the base, showing us areas that are not normally seen by guests visiting the base. Actually, the center can be divided into three separate segments, all of them important to military preparedness. First and most important, the center serves as the training and embarkation area for the mobile construction battalion. Second, the center is prepared to physically support the U.S. Marine Corps in any early assault actions in the Pacific. And last, the center will ship to forces in the Pacific other predetermined functional components maintained in storage by this facility. The development of the naval facilities at the base began in 1942 with the establishment of an advanced base depot. The greatest development of the installation, however, has come about since the end of World War II. The center's small harbor, which has a water area of a little more than 100 acres, became famous during World War II as one of the best run and busiest ports in the United States. Besides being home base for five construction battalions, it is the host of a variety of other tenants. Among these, the Civil Engineering Corps Officers School and the Naval School's Construction, which trains young men how to carry on the CB tradition of being able to build almost anything, anywhere it is needed in the world. Also on board is the Yards and Docks Supply Offices, which handle $125 million worth of inventory yearly. Another and most interesting segment of the base is the U.S. Naval Civil Engineering Laboratory. Its many and varied programs include experiments in seawater conversion, research in atomic defense, deep ocean studies, construction of polar bases on sea ice, and many more. In this room is housed the Navy's Data Processing Division. In this one small space, it is possible for a small staff of specially trained experts with the aid of the amazing data processing machines to maintain control of the entire inventory requirements of many bases both here and overseas. The battalion center employs approximately 2,500 employees and has an annual payroll of approximately $19 million. A spirit of friendly cooperation exists between the naval base and the city of Oxnard with a free interchange of activities for the mutual benefit of all concerns. It is anticipated that this harmonious relationship will continue for many years to come.
since it was only a short distance from the Navy side of the harbor to the civilian side, we decided to pay a visit to Dock 1. We were fortunate to be able to film the first load of cotton ever to be shipped from the facilities of the Oxnard Harbor District at Port Wyname. This first shipment of cotton trucked in from the San Joaquin Valley finally made a reality of the dreams of the harbor's original planners. In recent years, the steady stream of vessels using the Dock 1 facilities has been rapidly increasing. Mechanization plus the energetic skill of the local stevedores has made possible a tremendous increase in commercial shipping. During 1961, the harbor commissioners negotiated the purchase of Dock 1 and the adjacent areas from the Navy and are now determined to expand the harbor to provide additional dock space and improved facilities. With the planned expansion, it is anticipated that over one million tons of cargo will be handled in and out of Port Wyname Harbor. At the present time, the shipment of diatomaceous earth to European ports is by far the most significant export from the harbor and provides the major share of the revenue for the operation of the dock. Due to the rapid urban development throughout Ventura County, the importance of the lumbering operations at the dock increased 100% during the year 1961. Increased modern port facilities are attracting many new industries to the Oxnard area, which in turn will assure the future greatness of the entire Ventura County. Certainly one of the biggest news events in recent years in the industrial phase of the Oxnard area was the arrival of the Kellogg Division of the American Brake Shoe Company. To better serve and contribute to the rapidly growing space age industry, Kellogg, early in 1960, relocated its entire organization, including machinery and personnel, completely terminating operations in Rochester, New York, in a dramatic move to Oxnard. A new 103,000 square foot plant makes it possible to house research and development engineering, manufacturing, sales, and service, all under one roof. The Kellogg parent firm, American Brake Shoe Company, has evolved since 1902 from a supplier to the railroad industry into a worldwide industrial complex, with annual sales exceeding $170 million. The new Oxnard plant is one of the most modern, versatile, and fully equipped facilities of its kind in the country. At Kellogg, the emphasis is on various forms of hydraulic equipment for dependable, efficient operation in both civilian and military aircraft and space-age missiles. The fertile Oxnard Plain is one of the most beautiful and productive anywhere in the world. Until recent years, Oxnard was almost exclusively an agricultural community. Even with the coming of considerable industry to the area, farming and its associated industries is still one of the major providers of jobs and income to the people of Oxnard. During the spring months, large fields of deep green spinach may be observed. At just the right time, machines capable of cutting and loading 15 to 20 tons of spinach per hour move into the fields and perform their efficient work. Within a matter of minutes, it is delivered to the frozen food plants where it is processed and packaged and shipped to all parts of the United States. Broccoli is a common sight during the winter months. It is carefully cut by hand by field workers and trucked to the frozen food plants where it is quickly unloaded onto conveyor belts for the trip inside the plant. Here, it is cut to proper length and size by the fast-moving hands of the experienced women trimmers. From this point, it moves into pressure spray washers where it is given a thorough washing. It is then conveyed into the cooker where it receives a light cooking for about two minutes at 204 degrees. From the blancher, the broccoli is cooled and then placed in the carton, wrapped, and on its journey to the freezer. After a few short hours, it then goes into cold storage where it waits to be shipped to market. Of interest is the fact that broccoli only a few short years ago was relatively unknown in many parts of the country. Today, it is one of the most popular vegetables due principally to its wide distribution and availability on a year-round basis in the frozen food counters everywhere.
We then drove by the numerous food processing plants in the eastern section of Oxnard. Food processing started an unprecedented upswing following World War II. Two major freezing plants began operating in 1946, and about this same time, two canneries specializing in the processing of chilies also went into production. Especially noticeable in the transition are the many fields of vegetables growing throughout the winter months, where formerly the farmland lay untilled, waiting for the two summer crops of beets and beans. Also expanding at a rapid rate are the fresh vegetable shippers. Early in the 50s, the strawberry growers added their part to the new look. Of course, citrus is still king of the agricultural domain. The quality of lemons grown here is second to none in the world, and for years has been the top money crop in Ventura County. Needless to say, although industry and manufacturing are growing at a rapid rate, Agriculture, along with food processing and shipping, is more than holding its own. Where once Oxnard was famous for its beets, beans, and babies, it might well be said that the beets and beans are beginning to take a back seat to the more diversified grower and processor. But we still have babies as our leading product. Cut flowers are rapidly becoming of economic significance in the agricultural picture. A considerable percentage of these magnificent specimens are shipped by airplane to all parts of the country, and quite possibly a blossom grown in Oxnard might well bring cheer to a sick person somewhere thousands of miles from where it was grown. We were quite surprised as we drove through the industrial district to find that there are many interesting things to see that we didn't know existed in the city. This amazing self-contained hydraulic press can gobble up one half of a car body and within a matter of seconds compress it into a 400 pound bale about the size of a lug box. This business performs an important function in the community in that it encourages the removal of 9,000 tons of unsightly scrap from the countryside each year. While performing this necessary function, it also returns about a third of a million dollars to the economy of the Oxnard area. In recent years, industry has set its sights on Oxnard as being an unusually desirable place to locate. With our railroads, modern highways, commercial shipping harbor, progressive airport, adequate electrical power supply, and an abundance of water, Oxnard offers an industrial potential more promising than we in the year of 1961 can possibly envision. Add to these facts the advantages of an ideal climate, a beautiful countryside, a friendly community, and you have an industrial utopia indeed. Every progressive community relies on a well-run newspaper to keep its citizens informed and up-to-date on current events. In the city of Oxnard, it is called the Press Courier. The paper has literally grown up with the city. In 1898, it was founded as a weekly called the Courier and later converted to a daily in the 1920s. Ownership of the paper changed hands frequently until in 1940, there was a merger of the Courier and the Press into the present newspaper. From a circulation of 1,600 in 1945, it has grown to 15,000 in 1961 with an average of 26 pages daily. Keeping in stride with the rapid growth of the city, the paper recently moved to its present quarters in a modern new building which houses an impressive high-speed 64-page press. In 1961, the paper increased its stature by adding international news service to its facilities. We were surprised to learn that it consumes $100,000 worth of newsprint each year and employs a staff of nearly 100 people. The press courier has taken the lead in organizing many important civic functions and has been a vital link in the orderly and formed development of thriving, prosperous Oxnard. The primary purpose of boys clubs is to promote the social, educational, vocational, health, and character development of young boys, regardless of their race or religious background. Oxnard's Boys Club is proud of its achievement of having grown from its original 100 members in 1945 to over 1,000 members in 1961. The fact that the Boys Club is a community affair was highlighted in 1961 by the dedication of a beautiful new gymnasium which was contributed to the Boys Club by Oxnard citizens.
When the Oxnard Union High School District was formed in 1901, the town of Oxnard, which itself had been officially established only three years earlier, boasted a population of 2,000 citizens. School opened in September of 1902 with a staff of only two teachers and an enrollment of 32 students. Sixty years later, with the addition of two more high schools to the district, the staff had increased to 231 with over 4,400 students. In 1961, the district passed a six and one half million dollar bond election assuring adequate high school facilities for at least the next few years. One of Oxnard's proudest moments came with the announcement that the high school band had been selected to march in the Tournament of Roses Parade on New Year's Day. Many a tear was shed as our smartly dressed musicians strutted their stuff down the boulevard. Our thanks to the music department for this film clip of the band's prize winning performance. The year of 1961 was one of many changes for the Oxnard School District. The Wilson Junior High School, which for many years before it became a school, served as city administrative building, was declared unsafe for occupancy and too small to rehabilitate as a junior high school. It was replaced by the modern new Fremont Junior High School. Four classrooms from the Wilson School were removed for use in other sites, and the fate of the remaining building was in doubt. The enrollment in the district, which serves from kindergarten through the eighth grade, jumped from 3,000 in 1951 to over 6,000 in 1961. The district operated 11 schools in 1961, nine elementary and two junior highs. Operating expenses were based upon a $1.63 tax rate. This rate was possible due to the passage of a 90-cent override voted by the people during 1959. However, 1961 witnessed the defeat by a narrow margin of a four and one half million dollar bond issue for school construction. School officials estimate that district enrollment will reach 9,000 by the fall of 1965. Considering the fantastic growth rate of the Oxnard area, this may prove to be a most conservative figure. Parochial schools are also well represented in the area with a modern high school and three grammar schools. Oxnard can indeed be proud of its educational institutions that are doing a fine job while working under the difficulties imposed by a rapidly growing community. The citizens of Oxnard are very fortunate in having two modern hospitals at their disposal. The beautiful St. John's Hospital had its inception about 50 years ago as a six-room wooden frame structure. The Sisters of Mercy, who administrate the hospital, aided by donations from many sources, including the citizens of Oxnard and Ventura County, have created a multi-million dollar structure dedicated to the care of the sick and injured. By the end of 1962, with the addition of a third story, it is anticipated that the hospital will house 134 general hospital beds, in addition to modern treatment and research facilities. The Oxnard Community Hospital was first opened in September of 1960 at a cost of $350,000. It serves the patients of 25 osteopathic physicians from all parts of Ventura County. Its facilities include 30 beds, and during the year 1961, over 2,000 patients availed themselves of this modern, efficient institution. Oxnard's cultural life is expressed in many forms. One of them is the outstanding annual Spring Art Festival. This open-air art show with its gay, informal atmosphere was first started 13 years ago and now attracts artists and visitors from near and far. In 1961, it conservatively drew 5,000 visitors and 87 artists exhibited over 700 works of art. As Oxnard grows and matures, this festival may well become the rallying point for greater things to come, 
as its citizens seek to satisfy their artistic appetites. Another expression of Oxnard's cultural activity is the ever-beautiful ballet. We visited a rehearsal by one of the groups dedicated to this form of the arts. The Ballet Meme Company creates two concerts annually with performances in Ventura, Santa Barbara, and Los Angeles, as well as Oxnard. The dancers, whose age ages range from 14 to 32, are local students and some have gone on to exciting professional careers. Sponsoring the ballet company is the Ballet and Arts Guild of Ventura County, which is composed of business and professional people of this area. Its sponsors envision a day when Oxnard will have its beautiful new Civic Auditorium, where full-scale performances can be enjoyed in comfort by all the citizens of Oxnard. Oxnard can be proud of its many churches of all denominations. As it is in most communities, the influences for good exerted by its churches is a force that any city can ill afford to be without. In Oxnard, the vital energies put forth by the churches have had a tremendous part in the shaping and molding of the civic life of the city, as well as its moral integrity. In recent years, there has been a definite trend to turn to the church as the world moves uneasily from one crisis to another. This in turn has resulted in increased membership and the construction of many new and beautiful church buildings. There are over 50 churches in the city and each extends a friendly welcome to those who care to come and worship with them. January 1961 saw the completion of Oxnard's striking new recreation center. The 12,000 square foot building is part of a recreation project that covers 14 acres and represents a total cost of $500,000. The decentralized facility provides group meeting rooms, outdoor patio areas, arts and craft rooms, large social hall, and a youth center designed to provide the optimum usage for leisure time activities. Ideal weather allows the City of Oxnard Parks and Recreation Department to provide a 12-month outdoor youth and adult recreation program, both at the new community center, as well as at the many neighborhood parks and public school areas. The Parks and Recreation Commission and the City Council have realized the importance of recreation in community living and have encouraged the development of recreational areas and programs. As a result, Oxnard is proceeding with an intense program for acquisition and development of neighborhood parks in conjunction with the locations of elementary schools. Cooperation with the three school districts within the city limits allows after-school use of buildings and grounds, eliminating the duplication of programs and facilities on our eight park areas, totaling 70 acres that are now developed for public recreation use. These parks include athletic fields, kitty apparatus areas, wading pools, family picnic facilities, tennis courts, and community buildings. The Olympic-sized community swimming pool located at the Oxnard High School campus is open for a complete year-round aquatics program for youth and adults. The proposed municipal auditorium and golf course will round out a full recreational program for the citizens of Oxnard. The land use approved master plan designates a minimum of 20 neighborhood park areas that will guarantee the necessary open space to assure that Oxnard will have enviable recreational facilities for many years to come. Little League is boys and baseball. It's Americanism in one of its finer forms for it engages the basic wealth of the nation, its youth, in the great American pastime, baseball. Little League first came to Oxnard in 1956. Since that time, over 4,000 boys between the ages of 8 through 12 have participated in this sound summer recreational program. Under good adult leadership in the wholesome atmosphere of family and community participation, Little League continues to grow in Oxnard. 
After seeing all the recreational facilities in Oxnard, David decided it was about time to try them out for himself. So we visited Eastwood Park. He had a wonderful time exploring each exciting new ride until finally hunger pangs got the best of him and we spread our picnic lunch on the grass. There's nothing like a good old-fashioned picnic lunch to give a young man renewed energy for the rest of the day. David was going to need this energy, for although we had covered a lot of ground, we still had many places to go and many interesting things to see and do in and around this fascinating city of Oxnard. As you can see, David is proving what a good citizen he is by calling his grandpa's attention to the lunch paper, which is blowing away. Oxnard, 1961. Produced and photographed by Dr. Ted Greyhouse. Assisted by L.S. Leisure and David Greyhouse. Narrator, Dana Marble. Sound engineer, Paul Schneider. Narrative compiled and edited by Dr. Greyhouse. After eating a delicious picnic lunch, we continued our tour of Oxnard by visiting one of the city's better-known eating places. David had always enjoyed waving to the friendly chef as we drove past the Colonial House restaurant. The Colonial House started as a defunct drive-in back in 1941, when Oxnard was a little-known sugar beet community. When the present owner found that he could not dispose of the property, he decided to improve it, and in so doing, placed his faith in the future prosperity of Oxnard. Over a period of years, various improvements have been made and rooms have been added until today there are nine different dining rooms, each with a distinctively different decor. Bricks for the garden room fireplace actually came from the original White House built in 1792. Fine food and pleasant surroundings make a visit to the Colonial House a memorable occasion. Sixty gracious people comprise the staff here and their careers are devoted to making every guest feel pleasantly elegant. Many of the staff have nearly 20 years of service with the Colonial House. Most of them own homes in Oxnard and all are citizens of which the community can be proud. Another eating establishment which has had an interesting historical background is the Old Timer Grill. This place was originally started in 1903 by the grandfather of our present state senator. It is the oldest bar in the whole Tri-Counties area and boasts a bar which was shipped around the horn in 1800. In 1903, the entire ceiling was hand-painted and cherry wood paneling adds to its unique old-fashioned atmosphere. April 30th, 1961 was a memorable day in Oxnard for this was the day that Southern Pacific's crack streamliner stopped at Oxnard to inaugurate regular service to Ventura County. To celebrate the occasion, the Chamber of Commerce organized a special tour on the first train. Following the ribbon-cutting ceremonies by civic leaders and railroad officials, they boarded a private car amid cheers from a crowd of several hundred persons who had come down to see them off. At San Luis Obispo, they were greeted by a welcoming committee of city officials and were pleasantly surprised to find that both mayors had the same name. So, 
Mayor Davidson of Oxnard presented them with a case of Oxnard lima beans, and Mayor Davidson of San Luis Obispo replied with a beautiful cake to enjoy with lunch on the return trip. The railroad, by the way, printed special menus for the day which featured, naturally, lima beans. Wealth lying as much as 10,000 feet beneath the ground was discovered in Oxnard several years ago. One of the first discoveries of oil was the Oxnard oil field, located in 1936. These were originally shallow tar wells. Further and deeper explorations in the 1950s found more productive strata. By 1957, the field was producing about 5,700 barrels per day. Several other oil pools have been discovered during the last decade. Actually, there are three separate fields geographically which surround the city of Oxnard. They are called the Oxnard Field, the oldest of the three, the West Montalvo Field, with the discovery well coming in on April 1947 with 154 barrels a day, and the El Rio Field whose deepest well reaches a depth of over 11,000 feet. The pumps, somewhat resembling anteaters in profile, are now a familiar part of the Oxnard landscape. While oil is not yet a dominating factor, new wells are still being developed, adding increasing revenues to this area's economy. We were surprised to learn that in the county of Ventura, in terms of dollar volume, milk outdoes such well-known crops as broccoli, spinach, and avocados, and is equal to dried beans. Actually, Ventura County placed 15th in the 58 counties of California in commercial milk production for the year of 1961, producing well over 600,000 gallons per month. There are 11 producing dairies in the county, six of which are located in the Oxnard area. These six dairies account for approximately 83% of the total county production. The sight of appealing little calves holds great fascination for people of all ages, and especially for little five-year-old boys. About the only thing that could induce David to leave the dairy was the promise that he would soon be talking to real, live, jet fighter pilots. As we continued our drive out East 5th Street, we soon arrived at the Oxnard Air Force Base, located about six miles due east of the city of Oxnard. Our reception was most cordial, and we were escorted on an extensive tour of the base and its facilities. We learned that the 1,200 mile per hour supersonic interceptors stationed at the base have the job of defending a section of the United States Southwest known as the Los Angeles Air Defense Sector. We were impressed by the fact that the base annual payroll is around five and one half million dollars and employs 147 civilian employees. Actually, the base's landing strip originally was built in 1942 to accommodate light planes. It became a naval air station auxiliary in 1943 until in 1946 it was turned over to the county. In 1951, the Air Force took over from the National Guard unit stationed there, enlarging the base considerably. Being less than 100 feet from one of these powerful jets as they take off using their afterburner was almost too much for a five-year-old, and I must confess that it was all I could do to keep my hand steady on the camera. As we thanked the jet pilots for their demonstration for us, we couldn't help but feel thankful that our nation's safety is in such capable hands. Just south of the city of Oxnard on the Pacific Coast Highway is the area of Point Magoo, 
Until 1946, Point Magoo was primarily salt marshes with a few farms. At one time, it was the site of a small fishing village. Today, Point Magoo is headquarters for America's largest missile range. During 1961, 8,000 military and civilian personnel were employed there. The total payroll for the year for government employees at Point Magoo amounted to $37,800,000. Point Magoo, in addition to being headquarters for the Pacific Missile Range, is also the site of the Naval Missile Center, the Naval Air Station, and other smaller commands engaged in specialized missile work. The Pacific Missile Range is a national range administered by the Navy. It provides range services for the Army, Navy, Air Force, Advanced Research Projects Agency, and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Its facilities are located on practically every continent of the world with the heaviest concentrations along the Pacific Coast and on the islands of the Pacific Ocean. The Naval Missile Center is a facility of the Navy's Bureau of Weapons. It is engaged in research and development, test and evaluation of Navy missiles. Most of the missiles used in the U.S. fleet have undergone some phase of testing at Point Magoo. During 1961, test firings of the Army's Nike Zeus anti-missile missile from Point Magoo and satellite launchings from the Naval Missile Facility at Point Arguello highlighted activities on the Pacific Missile Range. On September 9th, the first Nike Zeus was launched from Point Magoo. Its solid propellant rocket with 450,000 pounds of thrust was the most powerful ever fired on the range. Its thrust exceeded by more than 50,000 thrust pounds the Atlas Agena B missile, which boosted the first space vehicle into orbit from Point Arguello in February 1961. In its support of the National Space and Aeronautics Administration, the range's most significant role was the triggering of the retro rockets to bring out of orbit the mercury capsule containing the Astro Monkey Enos. Early in the year, the range was assigned the entire task of establishing, operating, and maintaining the worldwide network for the Navy's navigational satellite transit. The heart of the Tyros weather satellite operation is located in the Pacific Missile Range Weather Center, completed at Point Magoo this past year. The weather facility which cost $105,000 is one of the most modern and complete in the world. Other new construction at Point Magoo during 1961 included $20 million for Nike Zeus facilities, one and one half million dollars for a new environmental simulation facility, and two larger hangar buildings costing $2 million each. It can clearly be seen that the business of research, development and testing of missiles, satellites, and interplanetary rockets is big business. In fact, it has had the second largest economic impact on the Oxnard area. As the world and the universe grows smaller with each scientific discovery by man, it seems obvious that the Point Magoo Na installation is here to stay. Our thanks to the Navy for the outstanding film clip of the launching of the Regulus II. A short distance from Point Magoo is Raytheon a company actively engaged in the electronic aspects of missile research which locally employs 800 people and has an annual payroll of $49 million. Its far-reaching national program consists of 40,000 employees with a fantastic annual payroll of one half billion dollars. When Oxnard installed its new sewage treatment plant in 1956 at a cost of $437,000, it was anticipated that this would take care of the city's needs for many years to come. Now in 1961, it has planned to double the plant's capacity with the hope that it will accommodate a city of 250,000 persons. All forms of life are dependent in some way upon an adequate supply of water. This is especially true of a fast-growing city. In 1961, city officials became concerned over our rapidly dwindling underground water reserves. Therefore, they proposed an $8 million bond issue to join the Metropolitan Water District and import Colorado River water, which will be carried part of the way in this tunnel through the Santa Susana Mountains. There were many who opposed the issue, fearing that Oxnard would not support further development of local resources. In a special election, 
the voters overwhelmingly approved the plan assuring Oxnard an adequate supply of quality water. One of the things which most Oxnard citizens will boast about is the ideal climate in which they live. About the only thing anyone will complain about is an occasional east windy day and the fact that for the past few years there hasn't been quite enough rain to satisfy everyone. However, there was one storm in 1961 which gave a few people a little more water than they really wanted. But the rest of the year was made to order for the sunshine-loving tourists. The average rainfall for this area is about 14 inches. In 1961, there was only 7.2 inches to become one of the driest years on record. Weather is unusually mild in Oxnard, with a winter average high of 67 degrees and a July average of only 74. The reason for all this moderation is due to the presence of low-lying hills, which draw comfortable sea breezes across the plain, eliminating smog and thus giving the region its perpetually ideal climate. It was the land which brought people to the Oxnard Plain in the first place. And agricultural products are still vitally important to the area's economy. In fact, the product of the Oxnard soil is even more valuable comparatively today than it was 60 years ago. Its value is such that a typical acre of farming land on the Oxnard Plain is now worth from four to $7,000. Early in the summer and into the fall, King Lima holds the limelight, with thousands of acres popping up all around. During the early growth of the lima bean, precaution is taken against many destructive pests. 1961 proved to be a good year for the aphid, and the fight to control it was the most concentrated in many years. Dusting to control these insects is done by both ground and aerial dusters. During the early morning hours throughout the summer growing period, the roar of the dusting plane is to be heard everywhere. Where once the dry lima or butter bean held sway, the green Ford Hook lima bean for freezing and canning is now predominant. Well over half of all the green lima beans produced in the United States are grown in Ventura County. As the lima beans reach maturity, tractors, cutters, and loaders move quickly through the fields cutting and loading the beans for transportation to the vining stations. The viner is actually a thrashing machine which opens the pods and shakes out the individual beans from the opened pods. The empty pods and vines are then carried back to the fields where they are spread and plowed back into the soil. Here the bean straw acts as a fertilizer which makes the soil richer and more productive for the next crop. The threshed beans move through cleaning and washing machinery and are then are packed in ice ready for their trip into the processing plant. Here they receive additional washing and are blanched, sorted and frozen ready for shipment to all parts of the nation. The beautiful orange tree, which so typifies California, has not gone out of style in Ventura County and still accounts for a good share of citrus production. Large fields of cut flowers dot the landscape around Oxnard. And although they are enjoyed by the local residents of this area, visitors from the east find them unbelievably beautiful. It was surprising to learn that cut flowers returned over $1 million to the growers of Ventura County during 1961. Big things are beginning to happen in industrial land development in and around Oxnard. Industrial growth in recent years has been nothing short of phenomenal. This industrial plaza consists of 125 well-planned acres for orderly industrial growth. Other sites are being considered that will occupy literally thousands of acres, which will undoubtedly make Oxnard one of the leading industrial areas of the county in years to come. As industry moves in, agriculture, as of necessity, must move out. 
This leaves an employment vacuum for the many unskilled workers who have spent their lives in agricultural work. At the present time, the city planners are attempting to provide the means whereby a gradual and orderly shift can be made in the workforce skills to adequately meet the demands of modern industrial requirements. The Saturn airplane is a high-performance, versatile aircraft of unique design, which was designed and built within the confines of the Oxnard Airport. Its builders anticipate that it will be ready for production late in 1962. It demonstrates another phase of the industrial capacity of this area. Something radically new in the field of aviation has been secretly developed in another hangar at the airport. This odd-looking little airplane represents a radical new concept in the art of flying. Its designer and builder, who years ago developed the Taylor Craft airplanes, has poured all of his inventive genius into this one machine. His requirements for this two-passenger plane include a speed of 120 miles per hour, a weight of around 400 pounds, and a price of $3,500. With the idea being that anyone who can afford a second car can afford an airplane of this type. It even has fold-up wings so that it can be trailered from garage to airport and back again. Oxnard's three-story, 50,000-square-foot city-county building, completed in 1956 at a cost of $275,000, houses the city jail, various county offices, and a municipal and superior court. Shortly after entering the building, a police call came in and we were able to witness the police department performing their efficient work. It seems that one Mexican national wanted his friend to return to town to have another drink, but the friend resisted his efforts to socialize. Actually, the average national who performs a necessary function in the stoop labor field is a well-behaved individual who, if given the opportunity, is eager to improve his lot. The modern Mexican labor program was initiated in 1943 as a result of an agreement between the United States and Mexico. At the present time, the number of nationals to be found in the Oxnard area varies according to seasonal demands from about 2,000 to as high as 6,000. The average annual payroll for Oxnard area braceros is about four and one half million dollars, with the individual earning about fifty dollars a week. Of this amount, sixty percent is returned to the economy of the Oxnard area in the form of food supplies and purchases made from local merchants. The length of stay in this country is six to eighteen months, and it is required that he be in good health. In all respects, the Oxnard Police Department is a modern, efficient law enforcement agency. Although it is not the case in all cities, the department has the high regard and admiration of the citizens it protects, largely due to the fact that the head man worked his way up through the ranks, from patrolman to become chief of police. Six divisions make up the department with a total complement of 60 persons. New men start at the rank of patrolman with a beginning wage of $432 per month. Each day in the year, the police receive an average of 510 calls of various kinds. The modern jail facilities can house 98 prisoners serving time. The daily average number of inmates during 1961 was 65. During the year, over 70,000 meals were served at an average cost of 27 cents per man per meal. Oxnard can well be proud of its accomplishments in the field of law enforcement. One of the problems which the city officials continued to tackle vigorously in 1961 was the problem of substandard dwelling. In the last five years, about 800 dwelling units have been demolished, and a good number more are marked for future destruction. Such things as broken fences, outside plumbing, untainted exteriors, and badly crowded conditions are rapidly being eliminated. Provisions are being made for low-cost housing, which will permit a relatively painless transition from slum 
to home ownership for many residents thus affected. The sign which states that this building is unfit for habitation declares the doom of the structure upon which it is posted and marks another step forward in Oxnard's determined effort towards self-improvement and beautification. Most cities with a population of 42,000 have citizens who have unique habits and unorthodox customs. Oxnard is no exception to this rule. Here we see one of the city's well-known men about town who has developed a keen appreciation of the axiom that waste of edible material should be avoided at all costs. Dale Park housing, which was erected during World War II as temporary housing for military families, is slated for removal by 1964. Here again, the City Housing Authority is making provision for these displaced families to be relocated in new, low-cost, private ownership housing. Colonia Village, administered by the Oxnard Housing Authority, is a successful attempt by the City of Oxnard to provide low-cost housing facilities for those families whose income level does not permit them to afford private housing. This has proved to be a fairly successful antidote to the persistent slum problem which confronts all large cities. 1961 saw the completion of 70 more units of public housing, bringing the total to 430 units in all. It is proposed in the near future to build an additional 100 units of public housing and 50 senior citizen units in a high-rise building in the downtown area. Probably the most interesting and unique development in low-cost housing is the move-in home subdivision designed for low-income citizens that utilizes houses moved out of the Los Angeles area to make way for freeway expansion. These displaced houses, still in good condition, are carried on barges to the Oxnard area and then rehabilitated and sold for private ownership at greatly reduced prices. Another radical departure from the norm for housing has been the Rose Park housing program, which utilizes federal housing procedures that were designed specifically for smaller lot sizes and constructional features. As a result, it brings the cost of conventional homes down to meet a market of buyers that heretofore have been unable to buy a home of their own. In 1961, the city of Oxnard approached the $20 million building valuation for the largest single year in its history. This boom included multiple duplexes and single-family homes. During the last five years, an average of 856 homes have been constructed each year. Prices, excluding public housing, range from as low as $8,500 to over $100,000. And the average home in the city of Oxnard sells in the $15,000 to $16,000 bracket. In addition to the many fine tract developments in the city, Oxnard also boasts many fine custom homes which can hold their own with those in any city in the country. Because of the exceptionally mild climate, Oxnard homes are adapted to a leisurely western style of outdoor living. As one drives through the various sections of town, it is interesting to note that practically every type of architecture can be seen. Probably few places in the country can present a variety of beautiful gardens and flowers to equal those found in the Oxnard area. A fertile soil, moderate climate, and loving care all go toward creating one of nature's richest sources of natural beauty.
General Telephone Company of California is the nation's largest independent operating telephone company. Oxnard, which is a division headquarters, covers an area of 360 square miles, serving more than 43,000 telephones. Of this number, 5,600 were installed in 1961. One of the most accurate yardsticks for measuring the growth of a community is the number of new telephone installations. This amazing number of new installations represents an increase of over 13% in just one year and typifies the explosive development of the Oxnard area. KOXR and KAAR are two of Oxnard's progressive radio stations. KOXR, which broadcasts on 910 kilocycles, went on the air for the first time in June of 1955. In September of 1958, KAAR also hit the airwaves as the first FM station in all of Ventura County. The 10,000-watt FM station was designed and built by its founder and present owner. In addition to providing many continuous hours of information and entertainment, radio stations throughout the country stand ready to perform a vitally needed function in their respective communities in the case of emergency or disaster. The form and substance of the city of Oxnard seems to change as the sun goes down and the neon lights come alive. Oxnard's many fine restaurants, shopping centers, bowling alleys, and other forms of nightlife bring an entirely new perspective to the skyline. Twenty years from now, it may be interesting to reminisce and try to remember when gasoline was only 27 cents a gallon. Or it may be fun to look back and see what the Christmas decorations looked like down A Street. Or what the prize-taking window display looked like at Christmas time. Many exciting changes took place in Oxnard during the year of 1961. A beautiful new million-dollar shopping center was completed and dedicated in Oxnard's North End, encompassing all the latest facilities for the convenience of the customer. The early western look of the old historic Mita Hotel stands out in bold contrast to the modern new 75-unit Motel Lodge. This modern motel, completed in 1961 at a cost of $750,000, had the unique distinction of being the only new motel constructed along the Pacific Coast Highway from Santa Monica to Santa Barbara. The local Ford agency, which is the oldest dealership in town, started in 1919 with six employees and sales of 75 automobiles. Late in 1960, when the agency incorporated, it had grown to a staff of 40 people with sales of 312 new cars. Goodwill headquarters, which for months was an eyesore in the community, while temporarily located in the old Methodist Church building, was replaced by an attractive new $50,000 structure. We were surprised to learn that during the year of 1961, the Goodwill operation in Oxnard grossed almost $100,000. As most people know, these stores are a non-profit organization and sales contribute to the hiring of over 600 handicapped persons. The $100,000 Nulty building was completed and opened for business. Another building, locally owned and constructed, was completed at a cost of $70,000. Finally, after many years of hoping, work was started on the widening of Saviors Road to a four-lane divided highway. This $850,000 state project, when completed, will move traffic easily from Woolley Road in the center of Oxnard to the town of Port Wyname.
In 1961, Oxnard lost one of its quaint old landmarks. The little green All Saints Episcopal Church was demolished to make way for an attractive new structure so typical of the many beautiful new churches built in Oxnard in the past few years. January 14, 1961, was a memorable day to all Masons in the Oxnard area. This was the date that ground was broken for a modern new temple to replace the old one built just 60 years ago in the year 1901. Actually, masonry south of the Santa Clara River began long ago in the sleepy young port of Wainami way back in 1892. Another of Oxnard's organizations which will well remember the year of 1961 was the Oxnard Monday Club. Actually, the Monday Club is one of the oldest in Ventura County. The club's beautiful new clubhouse is a monument to the determination of a comparatively small group of women who wanted their own meeting place. Donations to help build the clubhouse were solicited from the people of the community with one man contributing the substantial sum of $40,000. The Monday Club is a philanthropic organization whose membership is by invitation only. The Oxnard Club is a member of the General Federation of Women's Clubs and is truly a representative group of the women of the community with its members composed of all phases of religion, business, and domestic life. An active, well-organized women's club ex exerts a great deal of influence for the betterment of any community. The Oxnard Monday Club fulfills an essential role in the progressive development of the city of Oxnard. As it has in the past and is now doing, I'm sure it will continue to grow and to prosper. Not everyone prospered in Oxnard in 1961. Several concerns closed their doors for business for one reason or another. Fox Markets went into receivership. J&J &J Boat Shop quit business. Cotler's, a longtime men's clothing store in Oxnard, gave up. Sakey's Jewelers decided to close its operations while Denny's changed its name to World of Pancakes. One of the biggest surprises of the year was the takeover of McDaniels by the Mayfair Markets. Financial institutions fared well in 61 with the Guardian Savings and Loan moving into their striking new building. The Bank of A. Levy, the oldest independently owned financial institution in Oxnard, undertook an expansion program that by the end of 1962 would account for six new branch offices in the county. Other banks did proportionately well, and the Oxnard Savings and Loan celebrated its 40th anniversary by enlarging its facilities and boasting increasing, uh, increased assets of well over $4 million. The post office also reflected the rapid growth of Oxnard in the last 10 years in gross stamp sales which increased from 197,000 in 1951 to 581,000 in 1961. Surveys are underway for a new branch office in the Fremont Square District to keep pace with the ever-expanding city limits. In 1961, the 10-year-old Oxnard Community Fair was reorganized as the Oxnard Sports Festival and Junior Livestock Exposition. Actually, the festival consisted of four principal divisions. First, there was the Hobby and Science Show, which gave residents of the area an opportunity to display their handiwork and compete for prize ribbons in various categories. Second were the sporting events, which drew many outstanding athletes from various parts of the country to compete in a wide variety of athletic contests. Third was the Junior Livestock Display, which offers the 4-H club members and future farmers of America a chance to vie for top honors and prize money. And, of course, there was the Midway with its gaiety and exciting rides to thrill the hearts of both young and old alike.
the first week in March is the birthday of the Navy CB. And the Navy base always invites the citizens of Oxnard to come aboard and celebrate the occasion. In 1961, the CBs visited Oxnard with an impressive birthday parade which drew huge crowds to see the bands, marching units, and displays of CB equipment. The exciting day was climaxed with a giant birthday ball and coronation of the Queen. One of the gayest times of the year was experienced by those who attended Oxnard's first flea market. The flea market was inspired by its namesake in Paris, France, and sponsored locally by the press courier. Thousands came from all parts of the county to buy and trade all manner of old and new things, and some just came to look and browse. From its opening to the final closing moments, the flea market offered Oxnard citizens a little glimpse of its Paris counterpart with its uniquely decorated booths and Parisian music filling the air. Because of the outstanding success of its first performance, the flea market may be called on to do an encore next year, perhaps to become a tradition of the Oxnard way of life. Undoubtedly, in years to come, it will be fun to look back to the times when Barney's Pet Barn still stood at the corner of 6th and A Street. And perhaps those of a younger generation will find it hard to believe that the northwest corner of Dempsey and Saviors Road was ever just a bean field. It seems so natural now in the year of 1961, but will future generations believe that where now stands a multi-story department store of the future once grew the crop that made Ventura County unique among the counties of the nation? 1962 holds even greater promise of things to come than 1961. The proposed Bank of America building at 9th and A Street. The $200,000 building with an elevator here. And what will Monsanto do with their property in this area? Through the generosity of the Carnegie Fund, a public library was founded in Oxnard and opened to the public on May 15, 1907. Ten years ago, the library had over 12,000 borrowers registered and a book collection of 50,000 volumes. Today, in 1961, there are 26,000 borrowers who had access to 62,000 volumes, as well as an extensive record and music collection. Plans for a modern new $210,000 library have been completed and construction should begin in the middle of 1962. The library will become a part of the proposed new Civic Center site, seen here from atop the city-county building and located near the corner of 2nd and C Streets. The city, with a big financial assist from the Oxnard Housing Authority, proposes to build a civic auditorium on this open field so that people from all parts of Ventura County will enjoy its use. On this bleak-looking section of land, someday will spring forth the beautiful greens of a municipal golf course. Here at the corner of 8th and A Street, the Greyhound bus will build a modern new terminal. Oxnard buzzed with the news of the first high-rise development in the city's history. It foreshadows some of the really big things in store for the city of Oxnard in years to come. In the year of 1961, we can only feebly guess at the fantastic future that someday will be the metropolis of Oxnard. In recent years, giant strides have been made in the cultural life of the city. The Plaza Players were founded in 1954 as a non-profit self-sustaining enterprise dedicated to producing locally the best of the Broadway stage production. The quality and gloss of their performances, together with the wide variety of presentations, has provided many hours of creative entertainment to its patrons. This dedicated theatrical organization, who with the aid of many outsiders, built their own theater, accomplished the unheard of feat of drawing 150 subscribers on their first subscription season. One year later, in 1961, the number had jumped to almost 500 enthusiastic subscribers.
Just 16 years ago, a far-sighted group of Oxnard citizens got together and formed the Oxnard Community Concert Association. The organization was aided in its original planning by the Community Concerts Incorporated of New York. The Community Concert concept has made magnificent concerts available in over 1,000 communities in North America. Music as a universal language spreads goodwill and understanding among the peoples and nations of the world, as does no other medium. It expresses man's innermost thoughts and his deepest feelings. The association has had its ups and downs over the years, but 1961 will be remembered as the first year in which the organization sold out its entire membership in advance with a total of 1,208 paid members. Each year, this nonprofit group of hardworking volunteers chooses from a wide selection the four concerts to be presented the following year. Although David had shaken hands with captains of the armed services and captains of industry, he was overwhelmed by the beauty of Mimi Benzel. He said later that she was just too pretty to look at. Recreational opportunities in Ventura County, which surrounds Oxnard, are unlimited. There are several lakes where boating, fishing, and camping delight the entire family. Lake Casitas, which was completed just a few years ago, offers one of the most outstanding recreational spots in the entire Southern California area. The sight of midget autos racing around a banked track just outside the town of Camarillo provides many a thrill for children of all ages. Undoubtedly, some of the nation's top auto racers will someday come from these youngsters whose competitive spirit reaches a furious peak as these little machines scream around the turns at high speed. Ventura County boasts several beautiful golf courses where the duffers, as well as the professionals, can swing away to their heart's content. Watching an expert water skier in action is a thing of beauty as she skims gracefully over the water at high speed and turns and banks on one ski. Piru Lake and the entire Pacific Ocean are available to lovers of this exciting sport. And then, there's the beginner. Motorcycle hill climbing offers excitement enough to satisfy just about anyone. This rough and tumble sport is practiced in Balcom Canyon between Somas and Moore Park on Sunday afternoon. Would anyone care to give it a try? Within just a few hours' drive from Oxnard are some excellent snow-covered playgrounds where young and old alike can ride sleds and throw snowballs to their heart's content. Although most Southern California youngsters don't have a full set of snow gear, and since necessity is the mother of invention, we gave David the ride of his life on, you guessed it, an air mattress. Only 11 miles offshore from Port Wainami Harbor lies the intriguingly beautiful Anacapa Island, part of a chain of channel islands composed of San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, Anacapa, and others. These fabulous islands offer the residents of Ventura County water sports recreation second to none in the entire country. Boating, sports fishing, skin diving, sightseeing, exploring, and camping overnight are just a few of the many possibilities open to the adventurous spirits who dared across the Blue Pacific. Several years ago, Anacapa Island became a national monument. And for the past few years, rangers have been stationed on the island during the summertime to aid those who come to the island to enjoy it more fully 
and to have a better understanding of its wildlife and its historical interest. For many years, there have been several proposals made from time to time to turn various parts of the other privately owned islands into playgrounds for Southland residents. But to date, nothing has come of it. The interest in skin diving has increased in recent years until it has now become the largest self-participating sport in the nation. Nothing can quite duplicate the thrill of being able to breathe freely many feet under the surface of the ocean, while surrounded by the calm beauty of a completely new world. The feeling of weightlessness is an experience all its own. The offshore islands offer an endless variety of undersea life, which on each successive dive brings new experiences and new thrills to those who venture beneath the ocean's surface. Oxnard has long been known for its proximity to many miles of coastal beaches. In recent years, a great deal of interest has been shown in an attempt to improve these beaches and to enlarge various facilities for the public's enjoyment of these natural playgrounds. In 1961, the state spent $452,000 to acquire and preserve two miles of shoreline, the McGrath Lake, and 295 acres, soon to be developed into another public playland known as McGrath Beach State Park. After a long day of sightseeing and learning so much about the community in which he lives, David seemed to enjoy having his granddad join him in building castles in the sand. As they strolled hand in hand along the sunset mellowed beach, Grandpa Lee was certain that his young grandson was living in a city whose future greatness was based upon a solid foundation, not to be washed away by the whims of the sands of time.